Coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, Korea says no tangible progress was made during a fifth round of Korea-Japan talks held in Seoul over Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. A relative level of calm returns to the streets of Ferguson following two nights of violent protests in the US city. It's thought snowy weather and a heavy police presence kept protesters away. Plus, Nongak, a form of Korean traditional music originally performed by farmers, is added to UNESCO's prestigious list of intangible cultural heritage. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6am on Friday, November 28th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Inspired by President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's pledge to improve their bilateral ties at the APEX summit earlier this month, senior officials from Korea and Japan met on Thursday for high-level talks in Seoul. However, progress remains painstakingly slow on the issue of Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women before and during World War II. Our Hwang sang starts us off. For the fifth time this year, senior officials from Korea and Japan met to discuss Tokyo's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. What's different about Thursday's meeting is that it came after President Park Geun-hye and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe expressed hopes for tangible progress in the high-level talks when they met on the sidelines of the APEC summit. Around 200,000 women, mostly Korean, were forced to serve the Japanese military during the Second World War, and the issue has long been a thorn in their bilateral ties. Seoul has called on Tokyo to take sincere steps to compensate the aging victims, but Japan insists the matter was legally settled through a bilateral treaty in 1965. An official at Seoul's foreign ministry declined to provide details, but noted that positive progress was made at each round of talks. Despite recent controversy over the comfort women issue, the Japanese official reiterated Tokyo's stance about upholding the so-called Kono Statement, a landmark apology issued back in 1994. Also discussed was the planned trilateral foreign minister's meeting with China. The official expressed skepticism about the three top diplomats sitting down within the year, saying it would likely only happen after the December 14th elections in Japan. The two sides will meet again for a sixth meeting in Tokyo next month. Hwang sang Arirang News. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister has been appearing more and more with her brother in the country's state media in recent weeks. To go with her increased public presence, she's been granted an official title. On Thursday, the North Korean Central News Agent referred to Kim Yo-jong as the deputy director of the Workers' Party of Korea, a position that's roughly equal to vice minister. You can see her in the green jacket there. The 27-year-old was among the officials who accompanied the regime leader when he visited an animation studio in Pyongyang recently. She's believed to be a staunch supporter of her brother in the absence of their once powerful aunt, Kim Kyung Hee, who was uh, who has been missing rather from the public eye since the execution of her husband Jang Sung Tek. South Korea's chief nuclear envoy will visit Russia starting next Monday. Seoul's foreign ministry says Hwang Jung Guk will meet with his Russian counterpart during a three-day trip to discuss North Korea's nuclear program. This follows North Korean special envoy Choi Ryong Hae's visit to Moscow last week after which Russia's foreign ministry said the North is ready to return to the stalled six-party talks without any preconditions. A form of traditional Korean farm music and dance ritual known as Nongak has been inscribed on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage. With this inscription, South Korea now has a total of 17 cultural assets on this list. Our Kim ji has the details. 
A rush of adrenaline, and then comes the calmness one feels when encountering dongak, a traditional Korean music from the early 1900s. Coined as farm music, dongak was chanted by farmers while working long, back-breaking hours in the field to help them overcome the difficulty of agricultural life. The music is enjoyed today by many Koreans for its upbeat rhythm and performance, and now it's officially recognized by UNESCO as one of the world's intangible cultural heritage. Nongak is Korea's 17th item on the UNESCO list, alongside the country's folk song Arirang and the making and sharing of kimchi known as kimjang. Nongak is a creative art form. The performers and the audience are united as they're invited to join along in the performance's rhythmic changes. The recognition of Nongak as a UNESCO cultural heritage is expected to become a catalyst in the move to preserve the art form, to pass it down to generations. This will be a great motivation to come up with creative and systematic ways to preserve and develop our rich cultural asset. Also added to the UNESCO list this year is North Korea's version of the folk song Arirang, alongside South Korea's version of the song which was added back in 2012. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now, oil prices have plunged to a four-and-a-half-year low. This after OPEC refused to cut oil production. The price of Brent crude tumbled more than 6.5% on Thursday, falling below 73 US dollars a barrel for the first time since mid-2010. The 12 members of OPEC meeting in Vienna decided to maintain production at 30 million barrels per day. Crude oil prices have been dropping like a stone this year, losing around 30 percent of their value since June due to rising U.S. oil production and slowing demand growth in Asia and also Europe. Saudi Arabia blocked calls from less well-off members who favoured a cut in the amount of oil produced, saying the market will eventually stabilise. Back here in Korea, and it was one of President Park and hees signature initiatives, but her vision of turning Korea into a creative economy is only now starting to take root. For a look at where the president hopes the economy is headed, our Song Jisun reports. Since our inauguration, President Park geun hee has been pushing her vision for a creative economy. Now it's time to see for yourself how far the paradigm has shifted so far. An expo that centers on the creative economy's achievements over the past two years kicked off on Thursday. Citing global recognition of her three-year economic reform plan at the recent G20 summit, President Bach stressed that the creative economy is the solution to spurring growth. This is the second event being held under this name, having merged similar past events aimed at supporting startups. 21 government ministries worked in tandem to organize the event, and more than 600 startups are taking part, more than five times the number of participants from last year. Visitors can experience creative economy business models in this creative village at this expo. Here you can see how products based on creative economy could be incorporated into everyday life in classrooms, offices and homes. This is one technology that's soon to be commercialized, seeing how you look in certain clothes without having to put them on. The camera scans your body movements and dresses your virtual avatar. When developed into an application, this technology can be adopted without much additional cost, utilizing cameras installed on TVs. We are already getting multiple inquiries from home shopping channels and fashion brands that want to integrate the technology. The government is also providing customized consultations for startups to help small and mid-sized companies turn their creative ideas into reality. The event is open to the public, free of charge, throughout this weekend. Song Jisun, Arirang News. U.S. investment bank Goldman Sachs is going to invest over 36 million U.S. dollars of its own funds into Korea's top food delivery 
app. Bedale Minjok exploded onto the scene in 2010, offering users in Korea the ability to order food from a variety of restaurants with just a few taps of their smartphone. The Korean firm says the investment will be used to help it expand its services overseas by improving its software technology. Last month alone, four million deliveries were made through this app, with more than 140,000 food businesses around the nation covered by the service. There's been a significant shift in attitude towards marriage, and it's happening right now in Korea. More and more Koreans are saying there's no real need to tie the knot. New data shows more than four out of ten Koreans don't consider marriage something a person has to do. Just six years ago, less than a third of Koreans had that same opinion. The survey conducted by Statistics Korea also found that 47% of Koreans would be willing to live with their boyfriend or girlfriend, something that might have been looked down upon just a couple of de decades ago. Three quarters of respondents also said the process of getting hitched is just too stressful, not to mention the financial expense of a nice wedding ceremony. Well, it's time now for a look through the global headlines. We're following this Friday morning here in Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning to you, Mark. Relative calm has returned to Ferguson as the Midwestern community and the rest of the country took in a Thanksgiving holiday. Police said only two people were arrested Wednesday night in marked contrast to the more than 100 detained in the first two nights of angry protests, sparked by a grand jury decision to not indict a white police officer who had shot and killed an unarmed black teenager. Against a backdrop of boarded up storefronts, residents gathered for a turkey giveaways and church services where a pastor consoled the heartbroken Midwestern community and prayed for the families of Michael Brown and Officer Darren Wilson. Earlier, police in Cleveland released a security video of another fatal police shooting of a 12-year-old boy, Tamir Rice, carrying a toy pellet gun. He was shot by officers responding to a 9-11 call that reported someone was pointing a gun at people at a park. Police said the video had been released on the request of the boy's family. Mexico's president has announced a police force overhaul to unify all local units into one national force. President Enrique Peña Nieto said he would pursue constitutional reform that would pave the way for Mexico's 1,800 municipal forces to be taken over by state agencies. He said the overhaul would begin in four of the country's most violent states, including Guerrero, where 43 students had vanished on September 26th after being attacked by Iguala police. Relatedly, 11 partially burned bodies were discovered in southwestern Mexico, an hour's drive from where the students went missing. It is unclear yet whether the two incidents are related. In Japan, a volcano eruption has triggered flight cancellations as authorities issued a warning to residents. Mount Aso in Kumamoto Prefecture continued to erupt on Thursday since Tuesday, spewing out volcanic ash, muddling visibility, and also shooting rocks up as high as 200 meters. The eruptions are not considered large, but the regional office urged residents in muni municipalities around that volcano to be alert. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, Korea is known for having some of the fastest internet speeds in the world, but it could all be about to get even faster, perhaps by even one hundred times faster than it is now. Korean researchers have developed a device that they say will do just that and also cut the cost of the internet in the process. Kim Hyun-bin reports. 
The process of getting internet service at home is more complicated than you might think. At the moment, you try to connect. A signal from the computer terminal box is sent to the internet provider company, which then relays it through two other outside networks. The four-step process is not only complex, it's expensive. Since there's a fee for using those other networks, which are foreign-made. But change is coming. Korea's Electronic Telecommunication Research Institute has developed a device that simplifies the process. The optical fiber cable transceiver will cut costs by one-tenth compared to the previous process and it's made to provide ultra-high speed access. The current system provides internet at an average speed of 100 megabytes per second. The new device provides it at 100 times faster at around 10 gigabytes per second. The new product is still not commercialized, but it's expected to become a hot item once it is, not just because of its speed. Since all networks are integrated, the service price for network and operations could be cut by a third. When the device hits the domestic market, sales will rise at least 50 percent and it is expected to open up foreign markets in the near future. Experts say the new device is expected to bring in roughly $91 million in sales and will be implemented in the 5G telecommunications and other high-quality multimedia systems. Kim Han-bin, Arirang News. Now, today is Black Friday, and uh, originally, of course, this is a U.S. holiday shopping tradition, uh, but the buying frenzy has reached Korea these days, and for local retailers, it means pulling out all the stops to satisfy, satisfy uh, their customers and stop them, hopefully, jumping online and buying stuff from overseas. Our Kim Min-ji reports. Winter sales in Korea are up and running, but... They came a couple of days early this year. Why? Because the American Shopping Day, known as Black Friday, which falls on November 28th this year, has also ignited a shopping extravaganza in Korea. Afraid of losing out on potential customers during the spree, local retailers are now offering their own Black Friday deals in hopes that customers will shop till they drop. Black Friday now represents a big shopping opportunity, not only in the U.S. and Europe, but in Korea as well. We hope our sales promotions, in particular, will help us tap into the large group of shoppers that prefer to make direct purchases online. This department store has taken it a step further, opening a specialty shop that sells popular overseas brands not usually available in Korea. Products sold here can also be found on overseas online shopping malls. Although the prices run about 30 percent higher, when you consider import duties or delivery charges, the difference basically cancels out. Plus, there's the added benefit of being able to try out products before you buy them. It also offers after sales services and eliminates the risks of shipments getting lost in the mail. But what spurred the shopping craze in the first place? A surge in Koreans opting to make direct purchases through overseas sites. On Black Friday, the discounts are huge and there are a wide variety of products. I usually make direct purchases about once a week, but this time I'm waiting. Data shows that direct purchases made from Korea last year topped 1 billion U.S. dollars, and the total is expected to nearly double this year. As more people turn to the Internet to buy a wide variety of foreign goods, events like Black Friday are becoming more global. But for retailers, it means more work as they compete to keep customers and gain new ones in an arena that has no borders and continues to expand. Kim min Arirang News. Now, not one, but two film festivals kicked off right here in Seoul on Thursday evening. The Seoul Independent Film Festival has a long and very prestigious history, while the other, the ASEAN Film Festival, makes its highly anticipated debut this year. Our Park ji reports. Ten representative films from ten members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, will be screened for eight days through next Thursday. It's the first film festival in Korea that focuses solely on films from the 10 Southeast Asian countries, which include Thailand, Vietnam and Cambodia. 
Directors and film professionals from the participating countries will visit Korea to hold talks with local audiences after their films are shown. The festival was organized by the ASEAN Korea Center in celebration of the two-day Korea ASEAN Summit scheduled for early December in Busan. The culture ministries from each of the 10 ASEAN members have recommended one representative film from their countries. They range from documentaries and dramas to action and romance. The films have a good mix of popular appeal and artistic value. Organizers hope the film festival offers a window for Koreans to see the lives of people living in ASEAN countries. Elsewhere in Seoul, another festival, the nation's largest, dedicated to independent films, gets underway Thursday. The Seoul Independent Film Festival is marking its 40th anniversary this year. Since 1975, the festival has contributed to discovering new talents and creative minds. This year's will screen 125 films, both from inside and outside of Korea, over a nine-day period. 46 of them, 11 full-length films and 35 short films will be in competition for various awards. Park ji Arirang News. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off with the KBO Stove League, where the free agents are looking for the big contracts. And this year, records are being broken, and we're just in the first week of the free agent signing. While well, SK Wyvern slugger Choi Jung broke the KBO record with his four-year 8.6 billion won, or roughly 7.7 .7 million U.S. dollar deal earlier this week, that record is set to be broken soon as Lotte Giants pitcher Chang Won Jun is expected to sign a deal worth 10 billion won, or roughly 9.1 million U.S. dollars. Now this comes after just one year when Kang Min Ho's 7.5 billion won deal, or 6.7 million U.S. dollars, set the KBO signing record. And now moving over to football this time, where Manchester United ambassador and former United midfielder Park Ji Sung is said to be invited to another farewell ceremony, this time with his former Dutch club PSV Eindhoven. With the Dutch club facing off against Fianor this Saturday, PSV will invite Park Ji Sung for a special farewell ceremony, marking his memorable years with the team. Now considered a legend amongst many of the PSV fans, Park Ji Sung scored 15 goals in 87 matches with the team and helped them advance into the Champions League semifinals back in the 2004-2005 season. Now meanwhile, over to swimming and the ongoing controversy over Sun Yang's doping scandal. Now with the World Anti-Doping Agency stepping in to investigate the lack of reporting over Sun Yang testing positive on a banned substance six months ago, it might even lead to the Olympic swimmer missing the next summer games. Now, according to several Chinese reports, if WADA takes the case to the courts of arbitration for sports, the Olympic gold medalist may face a two-year ban from all international competitions. And if that's the case, the 22-year-old will not be able to participate in the next summer games in Rio and might even lead to him retiring from the sport. And we finish things off on a sad note where cricket fans all over the world received the sad news on Thursday that 25-year-old Australia international Philip Hughes died after sustaining a head injury during a match. Now, despite fans and teammates praying for him to regain consciousness after being medically induced into a coma, the young star never woke up and passed away two days after the accident. Now, doctors say he suffered massive bleeding to his brain in a freak accident where a bouncer somehow missed his helmet and struck him with full force. Now, Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott released a statement calling his death a sad day for cricket. It is prime. Now, our condolences go out to his family, and that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a safe rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Well, it's going to be a rainy Friday today. Rain clouds are approaching through the peninsula and soon drop light to heavy showers all day long. Actually, it will be upper regions receiving more rainfall today, up to 40 millimeters, while the rest will see somewhere between 5 and 20. But the mercury levels will not be affected by the rain that much today. The current temperature right now here in Seoul is above 9 degrees Celsius, but the top temperatures will be cut of degrees lower than yesterday. So with that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. Now the high temperature in Seoul and Daegu will rise to 11, while Gwangju and Busan top out at 14 and 17 respectively. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will remain mild, getting up to 20 later in the day, while Daegu and Tukdo should see a high of 11 and 12. Now be sure to dress warmly and have an umbrella handy before heading out today. And that's all for now. Back to Mark in the studio. Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather there. And that's going to do it for now. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour. Have a great day. And if you're in, watching us in America, have a happy Thanksgiving. Goodbye.